Star Trek Return of the Next Generation continues. A lot of fans at the Star Trek convention in Burbank, California are somewhat disheartened that a lot of the original cast members have been excluded for the feature. But this seventh Star Trek film is really a passing of the torch to the next generation. Only an abridged group of original cast members will be being aboard this time. I believe wholeheartedly that there will not be a Star Trek 7. This is a wonderful uh, film vehicle to say goodbye. I think everybody else felt exactly the same way that I did, that uh, it was, well, there's, going to be, uh, there's going to be another one. Star Trek 6 is the last Star Trek. Those were some of the phrases flying from the mouths of the original cast just as their sixth team effort, Star Trek The Undiscovered Country, was making its way into theaters three years ago. But despite the overriding feelings of finality in 1991, three of those cast members boldly signed on for a seventh void. I think that it's great that they're... Uh that they did manage to get a few of them in the movie, and it, it hopefully will make for a nice transition between you know the original series cast and the next generation cast. It's a disappointment, I think, to the fans that not everybody will be in the movie. Sure, we all know who's in the latest film and who's nowhere in sight, but it wasn't until we sat down with the screenwriters that a clear progression of casting events began to emerge. It seems that initially the entire original cast was in, but then Leonard Nimoy jumped ship. Spock character was uh, perfunctory, token, not really involved uh, in the story in any, in any uh, integral way. You could lift the character right out of there and nothing would change in the movie. You could have somebody else say those lines. Uh, just not meant to be in this case. We tried to give everyone a little something. But once it wasn't going to be the complete crew, we felt it would be weird to have the complete crew minus one. That that just kind of drew attention to that absence. So then it became, okay, well, let's just pick, some, pick a couple and go with that. With Nimoy gone, DeForest Kelly also opted out of the seventh endeavor. Ultimately, for story purposes, it was decided that Scotty, Chekhov, and Captain Kirk would represent the original crew. Sulu and Uhura were out altogether. We didn't make the choice of who was in the, the final picture off of any kind of prejudice of which character we liked and which character we didn't like or we don't like this actor and we like that one. It was just, we looked at him and we said, well, let's go with Scotty because uh, we'd had Scotty on the show once before and he's kind of broad and funny and this and that and, and Chekhov and let's play those two. It's kind of something the big guy and the little guy had some visual interest and there was some nice interplay with Kirk and Chekhov. For a long time we considered Sulu too. Yeah. Because Sulu's a cool character. Yeah. But in the end it was just those three. Star Trek fans have a lot of questions about the movie. For instance, why were some of the key cast members called in at the last minute for reshoots, huh? Those sets and Starship models, were some of them transferred from the TV series to the movie? How about the special effects? We hear some were recycled from earlier Star Trek films. Well, we sat down the producer, Rick Berman, and the director, David Carson, and demanded some answers. We have two huge models of the Enterprise that we use for filming. Uh, on the television series, and we didn't build. They, they they cost hundreds of thousands of dollars to build, so we use those same models for the uh, for the Enterprise in the movie. When we cornered producer Rick Berman for just the facts about certain aspects of the film's production, he was generously forthcoming at times. Then again, there were moments where he remained stubbornly evasive, even after pleading with him for the sake of the fans. The star is going to collapse in a matter of minutes. Optical effects, they heard. Some of them were recycled from other movies. One. One. There, there's one shot. I'm not going to say which shot it is. And I'm not going to say what movie it comes from. But there's one shot that, in, in the name of, of financial responsibility, we found the exact shot we needed from, uh, from another Star Trek movie, and we, we saved ourselves some money and used it. Star Trek Generations' budget was around $35 million, a fairly modest amount given the film's spectacular sets and visual effects. So how'd they do it? Well, for one, Paramount beamed aboard seasoned television director David Carson and cast him off on his maiden film voyage. One of the ways that we controlled the budget uh, was to shoot this, what I now think of as a vast epic of a film in 50 days, which is a very tight schedule for such an enormous movie. Why so short? Uh, because it kept the budget down. Oh. And because uh, the, the theory was that because I had worked in television so much, I was inevitably going to be a faster director than anybody else. Without my research, the trilithium is worthless. 
as are your plans to reconquer the Klingon Empire. Tell me about the reshoot. Why'd you have to do it? We didn't change any major story elements. We didn't. There were rumors that we were going to change the the outcome of Kirk. We were going to change. We were going to make Kirk's end in this movie more ambivalent. We were going to do this. We were going to do that. Which was all just rumors. It's not surprising the film's producer chose to be vague about what really happened. So we went to the captain himself and got the answer we were looking for. We reshot the ending of the uh, of uh, Star Trek Generations because uh, Star, uh, Captain Kirk didn't die nobly enough and there wasn't enough grandeur in the ending. So we had spectacle, and we had trumpets, we had timpanis going, we had, we had a lot of stuff going that we didn't have in the first. In fact, um, it cost $5 million in a $30 million picture, so figure that one. Wow. Yes. Well, how did you die before? I heard it, you were shot in the back or something. Yeah, that kind of thing. But <laughs> that's what the audience said when they saw it. <laughs> right. uh, <clears throat> so that's what was corrected. Every ship which has approached the ribbon has either been destroyed or severely damaged. The movie is loaded with special effects, courtesy of the wizards at Industrial Light and Magic. And one of the grandest effects is the incredible crash of the Enterprise. App applause after the crash. Um, right. Like in The Fugitive, you know, when the train crash. Yes. Um, our folks want to know, computers, was it uh, animation, models, what'd you do? Models. It was models. It was all models. It was a model of the ship, a huge model crashing into a model terrain. Sometimes the model was uh, projected from underneath and held from underneath, none of which you can see. Sometimes it was on wires. Sometimes, in fact, when the front end of it is crashing through the undergrowth, it was attached to a truck driving at 25 miles an hour. Technical wizardry aside, the film ultimately rests on the shoulders of producer Rick Berman. After all, he's the man who was tapped by Star Trek creator Gene Roddenberry to keep the flame alive. When the fans go to see this film, what would be the ultimate compliment? What could they say to you to make you feel good? I think the best compliment they could give us would be that it was a, that it was a film in keeping with, with all of the other Star Trek movies. Uh, obviously, Star Trek IV, the one with the whales, was, uh, was the most successful, and I think the most critically successful, as well as the most financially successful film. And uh, I, I, I would love people to compare it favorably with that. Just ahead, the captains of the Enterprise and their earthbound alter egos. And we'll meet the man behind the gentle android Data and the actor who portrays the most vicious villain in the universe.